So welcome back to the show. This audience is 98% women between the ages of 30 and 40. We are near 40 million downloads and all of these women are looking for more purpose in their life. And the first time you were on the show, this episode did so well. And I know that it's just going to be such a gift for people to get to be a part of this. And even more so because you brought one of your most incredible creations, which is your daughter with you. So um, welcome, Marianne. Thank you for coming with her today. I know that you've been doing so much of your own healing in your own profession and in your own what's calling your heart. Tell us a little bit about you um, and why you wanted to be here today. So um, my husband and I were in... um, um, South America, Chile, at the presidential palace, having my, my husband was being honored. He has a Nobel Prize, so people tend to like him for that. Just a casual day, just doing casual just a things. Casual day. Actually, it was really funny because for your women viewers, so we flew from New York and we got there, and um, there were all these events, and there was one event that night, and we arrived like at ten in the morning. My luggage didn't make it. I know. So fortunately, one of my friends, one of my husband's students, who's now in the government there, and uh, his wife is terrific. And I said to her, I need a dress. I need makeup. I need shoes. I need it. And she said, oh, fine, let's go do it. So we did. Went to the presidential palace. And there are all these men who are, you know, the top business people. And there are, there are all these people who are um, in their military outfits, you know, the whole scene. And one of the military men comes up to me and says, there's that book that I've read in Spanish, but I know it's an American book. Do you know about it? It's called The The, uh, Choice. And I said, well, yes, I know about it. It's about my mother. And then he looked at me and he said, are you the baby in the book? And I said, I'm the baby in the book. So, that turned into this whole thing. And three days later, they asked me if I would just come and sit and people would bring all their books they were that they were giving their families for Christmas. They had already bought the books. They loved this book. And they came and I signed them for my mother and for myself. And that began to help me understand the impact that being the baby in the book has had, first of all, for me, and for my mother and for people like you who really want to understand the journey. Um, So it's been an incredible experience really. And uh, my mother's adorable, as you know, and wise and great. But when I was younger, she was shy. And also I didn't know really that she'd been in Auschwitz until I was about 12. And so we had a, we always have had a very nice relationship, very close relationship. I know her, she knows me, it's, it's great. Um, and when I was in graduate school, she decided to go to college. And then, you know, when she was 50 something, she got her PhD. Um, and I've been along for the ride. I got my PhD a lot younger than that. Started my own practice, taught at the university. Um, I also do sports psychology, so I've worked with a lot of professional athletes and teams which, and, and, and coaches, and which is really fun. I really love it. Um, and so I feel like my mother and I have a more in-depth relationship than a lot of daughters get to have with their mothers, and I'm lucky for that. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful and lucky for so many things, and we're the luckiest that we get to be here and uh-huh. just... You, you, you both offer such incredible signal. It's like, it's like being in the most incredible Wi-Fi that gives you access to the strongest broadband, to the strongest vision. So, um, you know, Dr. Edith, I think about you because, um, so I grew up extremely secular and then went on a birthright Israel trip and then stayed there and kept staying there and then became really interested in Judaism and um, my, we celebrate Shabbat in my house and all of those things. But there was, there was a, a beautiful thing that I learned in those three years in Jerusalem. And one of them was that when God was going to create people, the angel said, don't do that because people will have free will 
and it'll ruin everything. And God said, <laughs> and God says, just watch what a person can be. And Dr. Edith, I've interviewed 650 people of which some of these people are your friends, Marianne Williamson, Deepak Chopra, they're extraordinary. But I have to say that in 650 episodes, you are the greatest example to me of what a soul can be in this world. And it is not an overstatement to, to watch you just live your life, to watch you speak, to listen to the words, to, to embody the way you embody such goodness, such compassion, such expansion. I think that's what God meant when he said, just watch just watch what a person can be. So I want to just say, I don't know how I'll get through this interview without crying, but thank you for being everything that you are for all of us as such an example. I think it's very good to be a good role model. And I'm hoping that I say what I lived. And uh, I know that in Auschwitz, I would ask, does anyone know that I'm here? I felt so left out, thrown away, as if I have done something. And uh, I had to learn how to find my true self. They could put me in the gas chamber any minute, but you know, they could never ever kill my spirit. And that's what I bring you. That suffering made me stronger. And I think you all know all about it and guiding people to give up the you, the ego that you created because that's not who you really are. You're beautiful. You were born to love and most of all, have passion for life. I'm full of it. <laughs> you certainly are and um i know that tomorrow speaking of life is your 95th birthday kanina hara that is Thank what is what a what a life to celebrate for all of us that should be a national holiday um i want you both to be able to to weigh in on this but dr edith you just said so many beautiful things and one of the ways you wrap that up is in saying how we have this ego and yet there's a whole other aspect of us. And um, so often people suffer unnecessarily because they allow other people who might be out of alignment to knock them out of alignment. And then they feel so small and then they feel so sad. And you've done the actual ultimate thing, which is to be standing in a living nightmare and to find like Viktor Frankl before you, freedom inside of yourself. Tell us a little bit more about that. And Marianne, obviously please weigh in if you would like to, we'd love to hear from both of you. Tell us at home how we can even begin to find the joy every day without waiting for it to come from outside of us. I think there is a key word that may be useful and that word is permission. People have as much power over me as I allow them. I was told every day in Auschwitz that the only way I will get out of here is a corpse. They took my blood and I asked, why do you take my blood? And the answer was to aid the German soldiers so we can win the war and take over the world. I said to myself, you stupid idiot, with my blood, you're never going <laughs> to win the war. Uh, so I cannot change the stimulus, but I can certainly learn to respond rather than react. So give up getting even with someone and forgiveness, especially to you, that you put judgment on you, that is something that you do. You guide people to finally, to find their true self and to be free, to be free. And uh, you cannot change the past, 
I know that I will never forget the past. I don't even know what to do with the word overcome. I don't have any idea what that means, but I came to terms with it, that I know. I don't live in Auschwitz. I never forget it. I don't overcome it. Yes, I call it my cherished wound. So beautiful. Marianne, is there something you want to add to that? Well, you know, I'm a psychologist. Mm -hmm. So you're asking me what to tell people about how to feel good about themselves. Number one, if you wake up in the morning and you feel like crap, there's something wrong. You should wake up in the morning with feeling fine, feeling joy, feeling like you're looking forward to your day, feeling like life is moving on. And if you don't feel that way, you know, first of all, we can look biologically. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating properly? Are you overdoing? Are you doing things you shouldn't do and you know you shouldn't do, but you do them anyway, and then you have to suffer for it. You know, be honest with yourself. And then the other thing is surround yourself with people who are lovable. And, you know, if you're surrounding yourself with people who are really difficult to handle and, and mean to you or uh, whatever, you're not going to wake up and be a happy person that the day is beginning and you have great opportunities that day because that's the way you should feel. I mean, should is a big word. My mother doesn't like the word should, but it would be wonderful for you to feel that way because life would feel like uh, it was worth it to you. And I think one of the things that I adore about my mother is that, you know, she's 95 and I don't think she's ever woken up with feeling like, Okay, we're on with it. I mean, that's the way she always is. You know, she's just always looking forward to something new, something else. She appreciates where she is and she always wants to feed you. And so um, <laughs> last night we went to La Jolla Playhouse to see a wonderful new play. And we came back and we played some games. My sister's here. And half and the halfway through, my mother says, You know, um, so my husband and my sister's husband went to a a baseball game and I can assure you that they ate plenty there I mean you know they have good food would you like that sort of thing there and my mother keeps saying you know I think I should get up and cook something I think that we should have food for them ready when they get home at 11. I said mom I can assure you that if they're hungry they will find food are you sure <laughs> so my mother always wants to make sure that she is supplying the um, the joy and the food yeah. and it's always yummy. Um, you know, I think to have people like that in your life makes life a lot more pleasant mm -hmm. and um, it's good to find people who will love you that way. I, I would like to just to say that there are two questions that you may want to consider and one of them is when did your childhood end? Because if you're a child of an immigrant, you get parentized. You actually teach your parents how to speak English. I didn't know a thing about peanut butter. I didn't know anything about tuna fish. Uh, I, I think it is important to find out when did your childhood end and you become the good mommy to you because that's the only one you're going to have for a lifetime, all of the relationship will end. Dependency can breed depression. You have so much love to give. I remember when you were here the last time and you gave me personally so much love and I thought she's got thousands of interviews to do. She's got her own kids, her own life. And it's as if every time you speak, you're speaking to this one person and you make them feel like they are the whole world and it's so beautiful i want to ask a question as a follow-up to what you both said which is i meet people all the time who legitimately feel as though a there's no possibility to feel good all the time right what you said marianne like you're supposed to feel good i was talking to a woman recently and she said to me gosh you know i wish i could feel good like 
60% of the time I walk around, I just feel like down. I said, physically, would you ever ask a doctor, how can I feel good 60% of the time? Would you ever be okay with feeling a headache 40% of your day or nauseous 40? Never, you'd never accept it because you have a belief that you can feel physically good all the time. You, you're really telling me you don't believe you could feel good all the time. And she said, no, I mean, I don't believe that number one. And number two, this is the follow-up question to that. I want to pose both of these concepts to you at the same time. People feel as though somehow guilty if they feel good, as if, so I said to this woman, because it got into some of this guilt. And I said, if you feel physically good, do you worry that your neighbor down the street might now start having a headache because you feel physically well? No, <laughs> you accept that if you feel physically okay, other people can also physically feel okay. But there's this fascinating thing when I, especially I speak with women and I've talked to hundreds of thousands of them, where there's this feeling of shame or guilt that if I was to be having a lot of fun, if I was to be enjoying my life fully, I would somehow be doing something wrong because there's only so much of that available. And then that wouldn't be kind to people who I have tremendous compassion for. So I think of all the people to ask this to, somebody who has gone through what you have been living with, going through all the things, you have tremendous awareness of where, what people around the world go through. You have tremendous compassion for all of the things that you've witnessed yourself. And yet you have the audacity to talk about joy. And so I'd love to know what you say to people who literally suffer with a feeling of there's something righteous in that. And I'm not sure that they're giving themselves the, 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 the right end of the stick in doing it that way. A, a woman came to me and told me that she was inappropriately touched, but how can she tell me because I was in Auschwitz? Right. So my response to that was, I knew the enemy. So it's very important to know how not to take responsibility for something that happened to you. It's not your identity. It was something done to you. So I refuse to be a victim. I was victimized. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. I'm innocent. And now, you are too. I think there's a funny, not funny haha, -ha, but weird, unfortunate, funny in that way thing. You know, we don't expect men to look around and if they're having a great day and if they're successful, that they feel a little guilty about it. Correct. They, they don't feel guilty. They feel relieved because men get really anxious about how successful they're going to be. They know they're being judged all the time. Whereas women, you know, if we fail a little bit, well, it's sad, but you know, we're women. Um, it's kind of ridiculous and it's, and it's old fashioned and yet it still exists. So I think that when women are consistently working hard and having success, there is this feeling that women do to each other of finding a way to be critical. You know, women are so much more critical of each other than they should be. We should support each other. We should be there for each other. We should, you know, understand how complicated it is to be a successful, a woman who wants to be successful in many different ways, not only with family, but also professionally, or, you know, there are many different ways one wants to be success, um, feeling that success feeling. And yet we go and we criticize other people, we criticize ourselves, Some, somehow we're never quite good enough, your hair doesn't look fine, your body, well, you've lost, you've gained some more weight, or if you're too thin, you've lost more weight. You know, I mean, how many hours in a lifetime can we spend being negative? But we women are really good at that. And it's a shame. And I'm so glad you have your podcast to try to educate women about this because it's, um, 
when I see women in my practice who who are are angry um, and critical and you know, you know just they're having a miserable time of it and they it's it's sad because a lot of times when I really work with them to change things they, they can say the right things but they go home and they're just as mean to themselves as they used to be it's hard to change so it's better if you don't go there in the first place yeah it's so interesting you know my friend Amy Purdy is amazing she lost both of her legs and then wow with prosthetic legs wound up being in the Olympics for snowboarding. Oh, she's amazing. She's, she's one of my, amazing. she's one of my closest friends. She's actually going to oh, be that's, here that's soon. Fabulous. And she said that there are so many days where she gets very mean comments and she's had to find a way to live with that, but they're not comments from what you would expect. It's from people who have a really hard situation and look at her and say, why are you showing all of this? Don't you know my circumstances? And she feels damned if she does and damned if she doesn't because here she is trying to show possibility. And she also has a tremendous amount of empathy for what people are facing. And Dr. Edith, I'm really curious your opinion on this perspective, because there are so many people who say to me, what you're doing is so positive. And in a way, it's not, it's not right. There are people who can never do this and do this and do this and do this and do this. And I look at you and I don't know what to say, because you're the example of, to me, the darkest, blackest night ever possible and emerging with the sun. And I don't know what to do with that when, when, when people have a hard time being willing to see that there's more over the horizon. But I'm curious if you think all people have access to a greater feeling or a greater life, or if that only applies to some people. I can be very simple at this time in my life. And I ask uh, perhaps someone, ask yourself, what am I doing now? And secondly, is it working? Because, you know, I asked you, when did your childhood end? But the second question is, would you like to be married to you? Because I know many times women don't want to go to bed with their husbands. And they don't want to do it, but then they do because they think they should do it. And then they resent the fact that they did something what they don't like to do. And they can fluctuate from guilt to resentment. That has to be so beautifully addressed as you do. You guide people to be their true self because they'll never ever be in a million years another you, not before you, not after you. And that is very exciting to me. I'm willing to turn anxiety into excitement. I love that. Marianne, do you want to add anything to that? I think when people are consistently negative, um, it, it is appalling to me that your friend has to leave, has to deal with that. You because, wouldn't even believe it. Because what she has gone through has, I mean, really, how many, of, how many of us, if we lost our limbs, would work as hard as we could to be an Olympic athlete? I mean, it is phenomenal what she has done, and she is such an example to everything. There was, there was something on Facebook I read today about this uh, teenage girl, did you see it, who lost her a leg because of some disease. And, she, and, and it was just this wonderful article about how many surgeries she's had. And I think she's 11 now, and, and she still does flips. She does all these things. And, um, and she talked about she does what makes her 
really happy and doing this kind of athleticism makes her really happy. And I mean, I actually watched it a few times because it was hard to believe that this girl with the things she has that were that are now legs can do this and what it takes. So to have that, um, you know, is phenomenal. And we don't ask that of too many people. And of course she does things, not everybody can do it, but I think what you're asking is does everyone have the capacity to grow? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. And I think that the answer to that is yes, but we have to think about what we mean by growth. And sometimes growth is just the eensy weensiest tiny little change, which leads to another eensy weensy beensy change. And you keep doing that and all of a sudden you've gotten from here to here but it requires the ability to be formidable. And, you know, if you look at kids in schools, if you were to look at a fourth grade class, you would never believe that men in inherit the world. I mean, you know, the boys can't keep their hands off themselves, off other people. Like, I mean, you know, they're just, sure. they're just boys. Whereas the girls, you know, they're sitting there quietly, they're answering questions, they're getting their homework done. Um, they're maybe gossiping too much, whatever. So I, I ask myself, what happened mm. to all that when they got to be 20 years old? And suddenly the boys all feel like I can take care of this. And the girls keep questioning who they are, can they do it? Maybe they've already had some depression. Um, so I think can people change? Can people grow? Yes. Is it harder in various situations? Yes. If you have difficult, difficult parenting things, if you have genetics against you, I mean, there are many things that make life hard. But for every single person, there can be this much that leads to this much, to that much. I love that so much because that is definitely Beautiful. something. Exactly, because we we cannot change our blood and then there is the environment and the third would be how i choose to respond to the other two that's it the more choices you have the less you feel like a victim my sister magda was the pretty one in my family and the funny one and the funny one she'll still tell you dirty jokes that she's a hundred so I remember <laughs> We are totally naked. She looks at me and she asks me typical Hungarian question. How do I look? Now I had a choice. I had the choice. How I'm going to respond to her. And I remember I said, Magda, you have such beautiful eyes. And I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. She said, thank you, you see. So you can concentrate on what you lost or concentrate on what is still here. And that was Auschwitz becoming a schoolroom. And you learn that curriculum and turn hatred into pity. Everybody needs to hear that over and over and over and over again. You know, it's um, it's only in the last 15 years of my life I started, came home from Jerusalem, started studying meditation at UCLA and learned how much we are addicted to the cortisol. Literally, the stress is something we get addicted to like nicotine. And we think that we are up against this evidence of things that happen when really on a biological level, we are literally addicted to suffering. We are addicted to the shame, the self-doubt because our bodies grow addicted to that chemical. And in this new edition of your book, The Gift, 14 Lessons to Save Your Life, you talk about practical and inspirational ways to stop destructive patterns and imprisoning thoughts. And it's a, it should be required reading for every human being in this world because of what oh, I you feel that way. A hundred percent. And especially because of what I've learned at 
a biological level, how we are literally, and what's amazing, Dan Butner was here who discovered the blue zones. And he said, the people who live the longest have less cortisol, which creates less inflammation, which creates less disease. So we are literally by suffering, we are getting addicted to more suffering and we are actually creating disease in our body. I'm going to go. Uh, to I, I was fortunate enough to study with Albert Ellis and he gives you an exercise and the exercise has to do with you probably walking on the street and all of a sudden this exercise always things get worse. Uh, all of a sudden you feel dizzy, all of a sudden you fall down, all of a sudden they pick you up and take you to the loony bin and then you, then you, you start yelling this, stop! And count 10, 9, down to 1. And it, he calls it a stop, the stop, stop, stop the thinking and see how you can stop that negative, that things somehow have to be always this way or never that way. So give up always and give up never and uh, just say, I can only touch you now. So I live in a present and I do think young, but not young and foolish. So when a man takes me out and wants to know how old I was in Auschwitz, I'm going to ask him to take me home. That's not that person I want to spend one more minute with. I'm not into chronological numbers. It's my attitude, right? So powerful. Um, is there, because there are so many beautiful teachings, that entire book is like prayer. It's absolutely beautiful. I couldn't put it down. Both of I read both of the books. In this new edition, right? It's coming out again, updated. What's one of the ways in which people can start to learn how to break themselves from those imprisoning thoughts? Maybe you could both share one of your favorite teachings from the book. I had a patient who went to New York to do a marathon. And at one point, she stopped. And she didn't think she can go further. And she runs into my office and says, I did it, I did it, I did it because what you told me. And I said, what did I tell you? Yes, I am. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. Lots of yeses. No yes, but. Yes, and. Yes, I am capable of change. Change is actually synonymous with growth. If you don't change, you don't grow. So change is very difficult. So if you go in the front door, maybe you want to try the side door. Uh, I think it's good for us to find that little girl within us who is crying and says, I want a caring mommy and I show up for that child and I tell that child I will never leave you. I uh, I will not abandon you ever that that you you create a safe environment. Even in a place like Auschwitz, that if I would have died, they probably would have found me praying for the guards. Hearing you speak is like watching a conductor conduct the most beautiful symphony. Is every time you finish a sentence, I'm just like, I have to really just sit there for a moment. So it is so beautiful. You know, I recently um, went to an event here in Los Angeles at a very, very prominent wealthy person's house who's very much in the entertainment industry. And she invited a lot of Jewish people who are inside the industry to talk about what's going on with anti-Semitism in this country, in the world. And everybody 
she said, is there for all these other causes, but have a hard, Jews have a hard time talking about this. And it was really a beautiful thing to stand there and to be a part of this event. And there was a lot of tears. And she said, we have to have the courage to be willing to talk about this as it's growing in this way right now. And a lot of us feel very helpless and overwhelmed by even discussing it. And all of my friends, uh, all of my friends from all different walks of life happen to be advocates for everybody, all kinds of people who are suffering. Um, I haven't stopped posting what's happening in Iran right now all over my social media. Anytime I see a person suffering, this is something that gets me, um, it, it, get, it wakes me up. It, it, it's something I have to do something about. And yet it's hard for me when it comes to Judaism. I do feel I never want to, um, for whatever reason, it's, uh, it's something I feel is not always as easy for people to get on board with even talking about. And I'm curious, since you've been through the ultimate um, wave of anti-Semitism, how it feels to you right now and what's maybe one thing people should know or maybe consider so that we don't have history, God forbid, repeat itself. If I may say that, the genocide is with us as we speak, but never in the history of mankind such a scientific and systematic annihilation of people existed when 15 highly educated people decided at the end of the day that they can put 30,000 Jews in the oven in one day. So it's not comparable to anything before. And that's why they didn't even have a word for it and they came up with the word genocide. I don't think that word was discovered then, but maybe it was the Holocaust, the Holocaust you know. Um, because I know that when I came to America, I just wanted to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Everything was okay. I would never even know how to say out loud how should. Um, when I was growing up um, in El Paso, Texas, um, after we'd come to America, um, I've, I found that, um, well, let me put it first. We first moved to America and we lived in Baltimore. And I went to a public school. I was, we moved here, I was two. And then I, we went to I went to a public school and I played the piano and, you know, the little girl thing. And um, my best friend was a African-American girl and uh, she played the piano too. And her parents mm -hmm. were so nice. And I didn't think about it one way or the other. I mean, you know, she, she was my friend and, and, and I had other friends. Then we moved to Texas. And so I was used to just being friends with whoever, seemed friendly and I liked and mm -hmm. feel. And my father, I remember, took me aside when I was in high school and he said, you know, a lot of these girls are people that you are friends with and you like them and they like you. But sometimes people hate Jews and that might happen. And you should understand that those things can happen. And I was furious with him. What? Why would that happen? You know, it hadn't occurred to me to put together what had just happened in my own family. I mean, my father's mother was taken to Auschwitz and killed. Um, and I knew I grew, I grew up without grandchildren. But it is, you're, you're absolutely right that there's something that feels very distance, that, that you know, we distance ourselves. And... Um, and my friends are of, a, of every race, color, creed, whatever, because that's, that's who I am. I remember when you came home crying that you were not invited to a birthday party. <laughs> and what did I do? Defense mechanism, denial, delusion, minimization. 
I said, oh, pff, not such a big deal. I just baked a little Hungarian cookie. And I'm, so I dragged her to the kitchen and gave her the cookie with some chocolate milkshake. That was it. I completely denied what is empathy. I never knew that word. And today I do. And I just say, tell me more. Love is time, T-I-M-E. When I was in college, um, I went to Florida, I grew up in Florida, I went to Florida State, and um, I never really thought about being different or being Jewish. I grew up really secular. I didn't really feel Jewish at all. I was just a person. And um, these two guys who lived on my floor in my dorm, I guess they found out I was Jewish. I guess they didn't like Jews. I had brought one thing with me from my childhood, which was a Cabbage Patch Kid, which was on my bed in my dorm room. And I came home one day and the door was busted open and there was a swastika on my door. And um, this little doll was hanging from the, they hung this doll from the ceiling fan and put numbers on its arm and wrote on my mirror, you know, die filthy Jew. And I, and they took like all my stuff. And I was, wow. nine, I was 18 years old and I was like, what, what is this even about? How could someone hate me so much who doesn't know me and like ransack my room, rob, you know, and, and like all these things. It was so, so scary. And um, I went to the dean of the school and they did nothing about it. Um, there's a huge uh, KKK headquarters that's actually in Tallahassee, Florida. It's not really a place where Jews have been paraded around for many years. So I held, I held the first Holocaust memorial ceremony on campus. That's what it made me do. I got involved in the Hillel. I went to Israel. That's what it made me do. So what it actually did was gave me a gift. It gave me a gift to question what is so big about being Jewish that other people would actually have such an opinion about who I am. And it actually led me to embrace such a deep, beautiful, meaningful part of who I am. So I'm so incredibly grateful that you had the courage to be as bold and as beautiful and as such a shining light as you are because the representation you give to people like me is huge, but really we're such a small part of the world. And the real truth is that you give representation to all people who've been through all kinds of pain and hardship um, but I just personally want to say uh, this is an incredible gift on many, many levels. So thank you for that. And because we mentioned it before, and because this episode right now we are recording while there are women in Iran who are going through so much hell, I feel like I have to ask you, what do we, what do you think we can be doing to make any difference? How do you think that one woman thousands of miles away is at all connected to every woman? And how might we feel that we could go to sleep tonight feeling like we did anything that could help? Well, you already did something that minute, which is you informed all of your listeners to take this seriously and to care about it and to see that women in that environment are so disregarded that it's only about what the male value, the male religious value is, and the fact that a woman would just be normal. Just I think we get messages when we are very little and we tell the boy that you're gonna grow up to be a lawyer or a doctor or a CPA, but you're gonna tell the little girl to grow up and find somebody, right? 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 right. Cinderella, somebody with a foot fetish is gonna come and get you. <laughs> and I mean, come on, you got to really think about the messages that you still carry with you and rewrite your script. My mother told me, I'm glad you have brains because you have no looks. <laughs> and I live that way. 
I became very, very studious. I never finished high school. I was accepted at the university in Texas because I didn't have any papers and they put me to a special class called English as a Second Language. And they asked me to write an essay. And I didn't know whether you drink it or eat it or a sickness. And, uh, and so guy said, he was so precious. He said, you know, it's like the old preacher. Tell him what you're gonna say, say it, and then tell him what you said. And send us home. And, and I wrote, 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 and then I put it in a way I thought he would like it. I got an A plus. <laughs> That's how I learned English. English as a second language. It's amazing. Incredible. Actually, just posted, I mentioned Deepak Chopra before. I posted a video um, he shared yesterday where he shared that he feels like the way in which male um, instincts have dominated the world for so long. He said there needs to be a awakening in human consciousness where the female and the female instinct starts to be more of what's prevalent. And he said, um, you know, the woman is the womb, the woman nurtures, the woman takes the seed and helps it to grow. And he said, there's, there's still such a, a an emphasis on war, war on drugs, war on racism, war on this, war on that, war on that. And he said, then the whole paradigm of war comes from a very male um, instinct and a female instinct is not that. It's through real power, which is not force. It's through love. It's through, a, a, it's through the compassion and the nurture. That's where real power comes from. And so he said, may this moment we're seeing in Iran actually erupt a much bigger, greater consciousness for women. And I thought that's so beautiful and it goes so beautifully with everything that you're saying. And I want to just let people know you launched a class online, which people can go um, to, to, to watch and it's called Unlocking Your Potential. And this really is what we're talking about. And in this particular case, we're speaking to mostly a female audience about unleashing and unlocking that potential. So what do you have to say to women who are listening, who don't necessarily believe that they are expert enough to do anything or that they've bought into uh, a lifetime of thoughts that says they're not worthy of, of being in this, in any role that creates any kind of unlocking or leadership because they've just been out of practice with that for so long. People have what's called, you know, that imposter syndrome. Who am I to do this? Who am I to do this? And I think that kills so many beautiful ideas. So if we want to encourage and empower women to fully unlock their potential, what is one thing that you think they should hear today that might help them to know that they have more than enough to give right now? Well, while you're thinking. Yes. I think, number one, they should read our second book um, because we worked really hard on that book to make it very applicable to everyday life. And it's practical. It's um, easy to follow. There are, there are some exercises you could do and I put in 17 recipes, so that makes it really fun. We talked about love and food. I think that this notion of feeling that the best is not your destiny is a very sad and difficult way to live a life. Because being the best you can be can be your destiny. And as my mother would say, it's a choice. So that's what I would say. Beautiful. I think I like to maybe quote my mother in the cattle car. She held me and she said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And that's exactly what happened. 
everything was taken away from me. And I still had my mind and I had my sister Magda. And when she was very hungry, I knew that I ate my soup, which wasn't a soup, you know, just hot food or something. But I saved the bread. And the following day, I told her I'm not hungry at all. And I gave her my bread. So even then, you see, you had the priorities and cooperation, not competition, not domination. So when Dr. Mengele gave me a piece of bread after I danced for him, I could have eaten it up and gobbled it up. And then I looked up and I saw my sister there with the girls and thank God, I climbed up, I said the bread, and when I was in a death march in Austria from Althausen to Gunzkirchen, if you stopped, you were shot right away. And the girls that I shared the bread with came and they carried me so I wouldn't die. All we had was each other then. And all we have is each other now. And thank you for being an ambassador. I'm going to call you an ambassador for peace and goodwill. That's you. Uh, I mean, I'm just just filled with tears because I think when our um, when our soul hears the truth, there's no words. There's just tears. It's just it's an acknowledgement of truth. I think we cry when we witness truth and. Um, you remind me of the late, great Esther Young Rice. I imagine you guys knew each other. And if you didn't, what a chaval is that? But she was also in Auschwitz. She was also Hungarian and she passed away a few years ago. And she taught me that the reason in the Siddur that we daven to be like a rooster, she never knew. And she said to her father, Abba, why do we daven to be, why do we pray to be like a rooster? And she said, it's because the rooster is the first one on the farm who knows that just when the night can't get any darker, the sun is about to break and wakes everybody up and says, don't you see it? It's the dawn, the first one. And that was one of the most powerful things um, I ever heard what you just said. And that teaching she gave me, because I used to say, why is this in our prayer book? Why are we, why are we asking to be like, a, what does a rooster have to do with anything? And you are a rooster. You are a rooster and so are you, Marianne. And the way that you guys live your life, you love other people into life. You love other people into life. So on your 95th birthday, looking back at your life, what is one thing that you feel you'd like everybody to know so that they make their days count? What's one thing that you think above all else makes life so worth living? I think life is about holding on and letting go. My definition of love is the ability to let go. And one of the things I am asking you to let go of the need for other people's approval. Because if I would come to you after my talk and you give me a compliment and I tell you, I would like you to be my friend and you tell me, ah, uh -uh, no, thank you. Now remember, the word comes up called rejection. But rejection is just an English word when people make up to express a feeling when you don't get what you want. So give up the drama, which God said that I have to be loved by everyone. So I think the expectations are so important that you are a realist and not an idealist. That is so liberating to not need everybody to co-sign, to not need everyone's approval. So tell us as we are signing off, um, where everybody can find the online class, find the new edition of the book, find the other books. What's a good place that you'd like to send them to? 
you write a, your own book. Many years people ask me to write a book, write a book. And I would say, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. And then Philip Zimbardo one day called me and said, you know what he did? The people who survived and famous are all men. We need a female voice. And that's how the choice is the female voice of Viktor Frankl. But Viktor Frankl was a medical doctor in Auschwitz and I was 16 years old. And my boyfriend told me that you never forget my eyes and my hands. And I asked everybody, tell me about my hands, tell me about my eyes. Because I thought if I survive today, then tomorrow I'm going to see my boyfriend. I think tomorrow has become a very important word in my vocabulary. It's so beautiful. And as far as the links to things, by the way, we can put them in the show notes. We're going to make sure that we have all that. So don't even worry about that. Um, I want to well, go ahead. I, I was just checking uh, quickly with. Katie, I think I think if um, your viewers could go onto Facebook and look up uh, Dr. Edith Eager, you will find references to the course, which she has done with my son, her grandson, and uh, you'll see he's very handsome, and uh, uh, and he um, he he does all all this social media, but also he um, has learned how to really interview her in a way that you learn what she believes and it'll really help. I mean, I, I'm blown away by how beautiful this course is. It's a lot of people are, are, are doing it. The book is, the new book is complicated because if you do it through Amazon, you have to actually say 14 ways because the, the book before that was 12 and it's, it's complicated to do it. But if you, if you, if you say that's what you want, um, um, Katie's just written me a note for, I'm oh, sorry, 14 lessons to save your life, um, the gift. And if you look at it carefully, you can order it easily, but if you don't, you're going to get stuck with having one sent to you from London, which is not the newest version. <laughs> okay. No problem. We'll, we'll, we will dig and find the right link and we'll we will put it. Find all the right ones. Yes. Um, um. We love communication in the in the new book. I've actually written um, a place where if you try the recipes, you can write to me and I'll be happy to chat. That is so sweet. That. It, there are a lot of Hungarian recipes of my mother's and then some American recipes too. Amazing. Okay, this is the last question. The last question is, it just so happens that we are recording this episode uh, in between the days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And, okay. you know, I stood in synagogue yesterday asking myself and asking God for to be a better person, to live a better year. And on the Jewish New Year, we we take stock and we reflect and we try to be introspective so that we can be the person we really want to be this coming year. And so that's a beautiful thing to want. And it's not always an easy thing for us all to feel like we're doing. And I know everyone who listens to the show really wants to live a life where they feel they're really being who they were created to be. And so I'm curious, as you're also going through these exact holidays, what's one positive or productive thing we could all think about so that we can, not just in this Jewish new year, but in our lives every day, maybe come closer to reflecting and not doing things that we didn't want to keep doing, but rather to do more of what we really feel is aligned. What's one thought that you think might be helpful as we all move forward? I am thinking when you drive a car and it's a stick shift and it comes to a point when your car talks to you that you got to do something, which is change. So when I change gears, what has to happen? I release the clutch. So ask yourself, what are you holding on to and what are you willing, is a very good English word, willing to let go. That's the definition of love, the ability to let go. And that's the hardest thing, 
In Jewish tradition, we have something called Shiva. But the Talmud said, after one year, leave the dead alone. They don't want you to do and, and yank them up again. And I think some of you may need to go to the cemetery and take off your shoes and make contacts. Because I know that the people who died want us to have a good life. They're not cynical, they're not sarcastic. They want us to celebrate every moment. And I think it's good to ask yourself, whatever you do, is this the best I can do? Is it going to empower me or deplete me? So I think it's very good to talk to yourself because if you change your mind, if you change your whole body chemistry, today your life can totally change of not being a victim, but acknowledge that life doesn't have a guarantee. It doesn't have a certainty, but it has probability. And so I hope you become your good mommy to you and listen to this wonderful woman who committed herself, as I do, to do everything in power that what experience I had will never happen again. So beautiful. Thank you both so much for all of your light. And uh, it just goes without saying that everybody is so nourished by every word. And it was such a gift, no pun intended, or maybe I did want to attend it to spend this time with you. So thank you. And go you. to your children and try to get to know each other because you raise them once and then once is enough. So when I'm over there and I want to say something at their beautiful dinner, I ask myself, is it important? Is it necessary? But most of all, is it kind? And if it's not kind, I don't say it. It's good advice. It really, really is. I want to thank you, by the way. This was a terrific interview. And you really um, have a very deep heart. And that's a gift to you and a gift that you give everyone else. So thank you. That is extremely generous for you to decide to say that. Thank you. I receive it. And I love you both so much. And uh, maybe one day you'll be in LA or I'll be in La Jolla, but somehow maybe there's some Shabbat in our future. I would love to, there's so many delicious people who wish that they could be sitting on the Zoom who you would also love, love, love. But uh, we, we, we can't get enough. We can't get enough. So thank you for being visible and having the courage to share all of this because it's making the most incredible impact in the world and the ripple effects are going to live on for all eternity. Thank you. Would you be so kind and show me your shirt? Can you get up a little bit? Oh, yeah, we love your shirt. I oh love my that God. Shirt. She is so cute that she I want to see cute. that shirt. Oh my oh, goodness. Oh my God. That is adorable. <laughs> That's adorable. So you do remember that my mother's father was a pretty well-known dress designer. And my mother, if you get to view her, come and look in her closet. I mean, she has adorable clothes and uh, she doesn't own a pair of jeans. God forbid, yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Thank you. Honey. Thank you. Happy New Year. Okay. Thank Happy you. New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. God bless. All right. Take care. Bye bye. bye. bye.